Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. And I assure you, I'm not going to take 30 minutes. But uh, let me tell you, first of all, I'm not here today to tell you that General Paxton should not be impeached. That's, that's not why I'm here. Bottom line is I don't know whether he should or not because I don't have the evidence before me to make that determination. All I'm telling you is this House cannot legitimately and in good faith and under the rule of law impeach General Paxton today on the record that it has before it. Uh, I'm not here to defend Ken Paxton. That's not my job. I'll leave that to someone else. But I'm here to defend two things that are precious to me. One is the rule of law, and the other is the integrity of the Texas House of Representatives, of which I've given a good part, the best part, of my adult life. Uh, what we're doing here today is very important. You've heard that. It's a very sober and somber experience and it process, and it should be. And there's, there's three reasons for that. You've heard, um, and I've heard conversation on the floor from members, and we've heard a bit of this today. This is only like a grand jury. We don't need to adjudicate guilt or innocence, and that's true. But this House, historically, and with its president, has always applied a higher standard to this, these proceedings than it has to a typical grand jury. The House has always been concerned about due process and constitutional rights, and above all, the fairness that goes with a process such as this. And there are three reasons for that. Three very, in my opinion, very compelling reasons. The first is that our consequence, that, that our actions today have an immediate consequence. If we vote to impeach today, as soon as we do that, then General Paxton will be automatic, automatically relieved of his duties. He will no longer function as Attorney General of the state of Texas. It's what I call the hang them now and judge them later policy. Uh, the consequences. Of, of our impeachment is that he will be removed from the responsibilities of his office even though his guilt or innocence had not, has not yet been adjudicated. The second reason that we, the House has always insisted on a complete record, which we have no record before us, no record, no report before us, but the second reason is it is our responsibility for, to provide a record upon which the Senate can make its adjudication of guilt or innocence. Yes, they will have a trial there, but the basis for that trial is the record that we prepare here in the House, and there is no record to send to the Senate. The third reason, and, and to me this is extremely important, and, and that is just as we should be but are not looking at precedents of the Texas House, future legislatures should and probably will be looking at this precedent. We do not need to be relaxing the due process and the fairness concerns. Uh, when we go home, these import are important. When we go home, we'll have to defend, each one of us as members will have to defend not only the final result that we reach today and the way we vote, but we'll also have to defend the process by which this determination was made. And, and members of the House, to me, this process is indefensible. It's absolutely indefensible. Not to be critical of anyone, but when you look at the precedent that has the precedent is so important. I recently argued a case in the Supreme Court of Texas, and our argument was that precedent matters. And, and as the court pointed out in both its majority and concurring opinions, it said that precedent is important for two reasons. One is because of predictability, and the other is stability. Stability and predictability. That's important in the law, and it's important in House and Senate procedure. Now, um, we, uh, as we approach this today, we, we basically have two prior impeachment proceedings and one that began as an impeachment proceeding, actually two that began, that are instructive for us. The first one has been mentioned. It's the 1917 impeachment of Governor Ferguson. And in that, there are several things that are very instructive historically that, are, that occurred in, in, that, in, that, um, in that particular impeachment. First, the House has always, always adopted rules in advance of, and they have always authorized the investigation into the public official. That way it is done out in public. 
It is done in, with the antiseptic of sunlight. Uh, this was not done that way. But rules are adopted in advance. We received the, any, the, the small rules that we have uh, less than a few hours ago. Uh, the rules were made up as we went in this process. And, and that's not the way it should be. Um, one of the things that the rules have always required since 1917, again in 1929 in the, in the uh, aborted Robinson uh, uh, land commissioner impeachment, and again in 1975 in the Carrillo uh, impeachment, one thing that the legislature has always insisted on is that the proceedings be done in public, that the public have access, the public have knowledge. Now, I think it's ironic that we're conducting this hearing today, we're doing this determination today during a, th a holiday weekend when most of our constituents are busy doing what you should be doing on Memorial Day weekend, and that's memorializing those who've given it all, given all for this country, or else they're spending time with their family. They're not concerned about this. It's like dumping information late on a Friday afternoon of a news cycle. We should be doing this in the open daylight. We should be doing it not with 48 hours notice. We actually had less than 24 hours notice that we were going to do this today. We should be doing this with full notice and full opportunity for the public to participate, not directly in the House chamber, but to watch and to attend if they choose to do that. And we shouldn't do it on a holiday weekend. We've always had the public involved throughout the process in the hearings, the committee hearings, and all throughout the process. Another thing that they did in 1917 that they've done continuously since then, they have always said that the accused, in this case General Paxton, had the right to be represented by counsel during the proceedings. There is no indication in the record that General Paxton was ever afforded that opportunity. Number three, since 1917 and all of the intervening impeachment proceedings since then, counsel for the, um, for the accused has been permitted the opportunity to cross-examine the witnesses. And uh, that never occurred because no witnesses were ever examined in this case. Not one witness was ever examined by the committee. Not one fact witness who knew anything about anything was examined in the committee. Do you know how it worked? They had um, these investigators, these kind of anonymous, we know their names, we know a little bit about them. These, these investigators, they came and spoke to the committee. From the record that I've been able to uncover, and, and I confirm this with Mr. Murr, they were not even required to, to sign witness affirmation statements before the committee. Now we require witness affirmation statements when somebody testifies before a lo for, on behalf of a local or, a, or a, an uncontested bill but we didn't require it in this instance. And what you've heard and what's in this report is not one shred of evidence. You're all familiar with the term hearsay, but what you have in this case is triple hearsay in most cases. It is hearsay within hearsay within hearsay. You could, no prosecutor would ever try to, to get a grand jury indictment based solely on hearsay within hearsay within hearsay. No jury would ever convict, no civil jury could ever award judgment or, or, or enter a verdict based on the evidence that's before this house today. And so that, that's another thing. Uh, there was no, no ability for, not, for counsel for Mr. Paxton to cross-examine, and there was no opportunity for anyone to, to cross-examine. In 1917, the House determined that the uh, impeachment proceeding would be conducted as a trial with all of the due process requirements in place normally given. Now, that's not, all, that's not the case with grand jury proceedings, but the House was convinced that it wanted to go the extra mile in providing fairness and notice. And so it was conducted as a trial. And one other thing that applies to every impeachment that has ever been done in the Texas House of Representatives has been that all evidence must meet the, the standard required under the Texas Rules of Evidence. And I will tell you there is not one word, not one sentence in the testimony before you that would be admissible in any Texas court of law under the Texas Rules of Evidence. It is hearsay, within hearsay, within hearsay. Here's something else that is troubling. In a court of law, some of you have testified you are sworn under oath. You, are, you testify under oath 
that on your honor that you will tell the whole the truth and nothing but the truth, so help your God, okay? And if you don't do that, and it is later found out, you are subject to charges for perjury. And because of that limitation, most people, not all people, but most people tell the truth when they're giving official testimony. It concerns me, and I hope it concerns you, that in this case, not one, not in this impeachment proceeding, not one witness was put under oath. Not the investigators who testified what person A testified that person B told them. Person A was never put on oath, under oath. Person B was never put on, under oath. No one was put under oath. And so you have all these things that amount to accusations, but not testimony and certainly not evidence. And that concerns me. It concerns me a lot because today it could be General Paxton, tomorrow it could be you, and, and the next day it could be me. We, uh, our fundamental rights of due process are so important to every one of us, and they're important to preserving the republic that we have. Now, one other thing, as I said, the testimony was, has always, in the Texas House, any testimony used to convict any someone, to impeach someone, has always been under oath with penalty of perjury. And another thing that has always been done, and we're breaking precedent in that regard, is counsel for the accused has always been permitted to attend within the House chamber, the open chamber of the House, to represent the accused. Members of the, of the, of the House have always been given the opportunity, even though they will not, on the, no, you're not serve on the committee, they have been given the opportunity to submit written questions to be asked of the witnesses. That never, ever occurred in this case. So, so in 1917, you had rules adopted in advance, so everybody knew what the rules were. You had the public uh, involved in the proceedings. You had the accused with the right to be represented by counsel. You had the right to cross-examination. It was conducted like a trial. Evidence was, um, was admissible, and all testimony was given under oath. That was what due process and fairness looked like in the Texas House of Representatives in 1917. And in my opinion, that's what due process and fairness should still look like today, not only in the Texas House of Representatives, but everywhere. Let's talk a minute about the 1975 impeachment of um, proceeding in, in, involving Judge O.P. Carrillo. Two members of our House were present for that, uh, Speaker Craddock and, and Representative Thompson were, were, um, were both present for that. The, uh, the author, m many of you know, it was, the, it was uh, Terry Canales Sr., who was, uh, and I believe Mr. Bryant was present at, at, at that time too. Um, but uh, Terry Canales Sr. was the uh, author of the, re the impeachment resolution. But in, it's very instructive what happened in, in, two, in 1975, because at the beginning of the proceeding, uh, Mr. Judge Carrillo, Carrillo was notified that there was an impeachment proceeding investigation pending. And the uh, House Select Committee sent this notice directly to Judge uh, Carrillo by, by, uh, by telegram. They said, um, you are invited to be present in person or by an attorney, any evidence you care to present bearing on the inquiry will be welcome. The principal function of this committee is to develop facts and your assistance in this endeavor will be appreciated. And so the accused was told, if you've got any evidence, anything you want us to know, anything you want us to, that, might, that might be used to exculpate your guilt in this case, we want to see it because we want to be fair and we want due process. And so that's what fairness, that's what due process looked like in the Texas House in 1975, and that's the way it should still look. We've, we've learned from the record and from talking to some of the committee members that just uh, General Paxton was never notified of these proceedings. He was never invited, much less allowed, to provide any material, any evidence, or any testimony that might in any way be exculpatory toward his guilt. That is not fairness. That is not due process. That is the, not the way that things should be done. A couple, other words, a couple of other words about the uh, Carrillo um, 
impeachment proceeding, um, their um, members then were allowed to submit questions. All members were involved, were allowed to submit questions to all of the witnesses. They actually had witnesses in that case. Uh, there were 32 witnesses, as a matter of fact. All witnesses who testified were testifying based on personal knowledge, not one in this case based on personal knowledge. And they testified under oath for approximately 70 hours of testimony before the House committee that considered impeachment in that situation. They accumulated 15 volumes of testimony. Uh, they had 170 documents in evidence. What we have is, is a, uh, we don't have a report. We've always had a report. There's no report. There is a transcript and it is 170 pages, somewhere in that range. It's, it's thin, it's just 170 pages. Not one document, in that, in that case, 170 documents were submitted as part of the report in evidence. In this case, although multiple documents are referred to as being highly incriminatory to General Paxton, or referred to in the report, not one of those documents has been provided to the House and not one is attached to any report that's been provided to the House. And so you have that matter of due process. It's, it's like in 2000, in 1975, the House embarked on a, a slow and deliberative process. Uh, they, they, in, they invited uh, the accused to attend and present any evidence that might bear on his innocence. And, and they, they gave the opportunity for cross-examination by the uh, counsel for, for the accused. And um, that was what due process and fairness looked like in 1975 in the Texas House, and it's what it should look like here today. You know, members, I'm, I'm aware that there are certain members in this House, certain people in this chamber, who want to get rid of General Paxton for uh, whatever reason in the worst possible way. And I'm here to tell you that what we are doing is absolutely the worst possible way. There's a right way to do things and there's a wrong way to do things. If you wanna do this the right way, what we should do is vote no on the resolution today. If you want to, we can come back as a committee and do this the right way. And the right way would be to ask witness, invite, we have subpoena power. We can compel these witnesses who supposedly have factual knowledge, we can compel them to come in, testify under oath with opportunity for cross-examination. We can notify the attorney general. We can subpoena documents. We can allow the attorney general to appear and present any exculpatory material that he might have, and we can do it the right way. And the committee can do that while we're, after we have adjourned the session, we can be called back for a one-day hearing to consider a real record that gives us a sufficient basis. You've heard, this, uh, you've heard this compared to a grand jury proceeding, and in some ways it's like a grand jury proceeding, and in other ways it is not. But I can tell you this, that no grand jury can, can legitimately indict any individual, any potential criminal defendant without evidence. You can't indict without evidence, period. And what you're being asked to do today is to impeach without evidence. It is all rumor, it is all innuendo, it is all speculation, it is all things that we may speculate to be true, but we don't have what is defined or what qualifies as evidence in any court at law, not only in Texas, not only in the United States, but in most developed countries in the world. And so I would just say this, that I want to be, if I'm ever gonna be in part of any impeachment proceeding that actually results in the impeachment of an officer, I don't want to, it to look like a Saturday mob out for an afternoon lynching. I want it to look like a clear, deliberative, somber and sober exercise in the quasi-judicial function that the Constitution gives us the right to engage in. Members, thank you so much for your attention today. Uh, I appreciate uh, the time you've given me.